Reverend Tiffany Barsati is a researcher, a mystic, and a scientist, and she's going a long way in her research toward, toward helping us understand the matrix of the body and soul, how the emotions feed in, and how all of these things work into us ancestrally. And I've interviewed her a couple times on Gaia TV, if you'd like to go there and see some of those interviews after this is done. But today we're going to be talking about how this information, even through our mitochondria, is carried forward into our current dynamics and how that impacts within our family. So it's transgenerational family therapy is kind of what we're looking at here. So without further ado, let's bring Tiffany on. Hi, Tiffany. Hello, Regina. It's so lovely you to be gorgeous. with you. It's good to see you virtually, if not in the studio. That would be better, but I'll take what I can get. <laughs> what I thought we'd talk about, we one of the things you do, you do workshops that kind of flow through a number of types of clearings and types of therapeutic work with your clients. And one of them is clearing ancestral family patterns. And first, I'd like you to just give us an overview of Kind of what you do personally and your objective with your clients is so we can kind of see where you're coming from before we start and get start getting into the subject matter itself very cool so i find that transgenerational healing and transgenerational wounds are fascinating in the whole continuum of getting off the karmic wheel as we have spoken about before in in the other in the guy interview and it's, it really comes down to the fact that we have been handed over time information. You just think about DNA as information. You think about people's experiences in our family as uh, information, things that we are intended to deal with. Some call it karmic. Some call it you know, fate, destiny, what, whatever it is. And how it turns up in, in my healing work is it's rather somewhat random. I don't always set off on the path to find a transgenerational wound or issue. That's, that's not always the, the goal. But when it comes up, it's always very significant. And the way it comes up can be in the middle of a process or in the middle of a tuning session. It can be in the middle, middle of um, it's actually what I'm tuned in sort of listening for root cause. My interest in helping a person is looking for the root cause. Where, where is it that, that this sort of pattern got going? Because so much that's come through our family is learned behavior, but it's also these things that we didn't even know were part of our generational habits, and yet they show up in our lives. So that's how I see them. I thought what we'd do first uh, along that line is talk about, as we understand it, the nature of the subconscious mind, this great repository of everything. Because if you don't understand the subconscious and the way it works, it's very difficult to figure out any kind of make rhyme or reason of the family dynamics and other dynamics we find ourselves in throughout our lifetime. So let's go, let's launch into the nature of the subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. So one of my favorite topics, uh, you know, it's interesting because subconsciously we process about 400 billion bits inf of information per second. And there are resources in scientific resources that give us this information. So when you think about it from the, the sort of wild edges of our lives of where our every sense of ours is perceiving. So whether it's our sighted sense, whether it's our listening sense, whether it's our just energetic sense, we're constantly on this, per, this road of perception and perceiving all the, all the information that's going on around us. If the conscious mind is only processing approximately 256 bits per second, that's leaving a lot to the subconscious to be able to filter through. So the subconscious is also being um, informed of transgenerational pieces of information, as well as everything in our history. So I, I really appreciate Candace Pert's work in, in this area where she really looked at the endorphin at every single cell site. That she, that's what she found in her research. And when we think about this from a neurotransmitter and, and the biogenic amines, all of the biochemicals in our body that are 
taking those perceptions that we're perceiving in the outside world and our body is actually doing something with them. So kind of fascinating. It really is. And what we're talking about, when you, when you enter biochemistry into it, with every thought that filters in, and we'll just stick for the moment with conscious thought, although we know that this is happening unconsciously or subconsciously as well. But as we're experiencing something, perceiving something, we're noticing a cascade of chemicals responding in the body. And the response of those chemicals are directly related to what is already loaded into the subconscious. Is this a good thing that's happening? Is this a dangerous thing that's happening? All of this is happening unconsciously while our mind is trying to sort through it and the chemical cascade begins. Tell us about that. Yeah. So uh, what I like to say and teach is that every thought creates a hormone. Everything that we perceive creates some sort of chemical cascade in our body. And we are responsible ultimately for that. Where is our positioning? And our positioning is so much in what our focus is. And that brings in the reticular activating system and so many other facets that we've had some fortune to speak about. Because the, that region of the brain, actually, while I'm speaking on it, is having to do with alert consciousness but it's also the, con the consciousness that will wake you up if there's a fire in your house and you need to get out and you're asleep. So it's a, these are particular sort of refinements within our consciousness and all having to do with this cascade of emotions, hormones, how they're actually, how our body and our senses are communicating in, in every facet. The vagus nerve is the, the byway, the highway for a lot of this cascading to go on. Let's talk about that because more and more um, kind of scientific studies and news has been coming out in recent years about the vagus nerve and its role. And it's not really that well, it hasn't been that well understood, but it's really critical and at the, the center of how our body is interfacing for one with our emotions as well. So let's talk about the vagus nerve where it is, what its function is, why so many people have horrid digestive disorders as the anxiety at large ratchets up. Yeah, so an anxiety on this line has a lot to do with earlier traumas that can be carried down the line as well. Does every trauma in your family that's ever not been resolved have to be resolved by you? No, but there's something that we need to tease out, a very important piece, and this is what I find intuitively working with people. Is it a biochemical alignment that we need to fix with somebody's or address with somebody's uh, anxiety, or is it traumatic? So anxiety can be teased out, whether it be biochemically or looking at a certain trauma. So what I'm finding when I look into a person's sort of energetic structures is I'm naturally being sort of leaned into, we could do all the beautiful traumatic work and clean up transgenerational wounds and all of that. But biochemically, we may have been altered because of these traumas and experiences and things like that. So it's a really important piece I'm finding that the physical piece is the last to get hit with something for things that happen out in our field but it is the, the final frontier for our actual healing. So this is, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm just nodding in agreement. It's so true. And if you go because you you're overwhelmed with some kind of anxiety or concern, you're troubled, and you go to an MD or you go to a psychologist or psychiatrist, basically putting you on drugs that will start, numb you out for a little bit is not going to help in these affairs particularly, although it might, it's it, for some people it might save their lives in the moment if they're overwhelmed, but it's not a holistic way to approach this issue. It's so complex. That's tr very true. And a lot of people are going to benzodiazepines these days and like in the form of Xanax and that's creating a whole other set of situations for people to that, that then need to get off of them at some point because they realize this isn't something I can deal with for the rest of my life by just drug therapy. And there's, there's downsides to that. And not all doctors are, are really good about giving warnings on what it actually means to go on a benzodiazepine. 
Tell us, let's go back to the vagus nerve and yes. what it is responsible for. And do these drugs have an impact on the functioning of the vagus nerve? I, I would say yes, because everything has to do with communication in the body. The, the vagus is the, the 10th cranial nerve. It branches out of the back of the head at the brain stem, along with all the other cranial nerves. But it's the only one that wanders all the way through every organ and system in the body. So it connects the heart, it's respiration, it's rest and digest. It's the, the branches for both parasympathetic and sympathetic nerve fibers. Then it's got this communication to the gut as well as to the genitals. So you know it's not flight, just fight, flight, freeze, fornicate. There, there are many other con, mm, constituents and important attributes to our stress responses. So... When you shut that down, when, you, when you're taking, say, drugs, for example, it has a tendency to shut down the communication, as I'm assuming what you just said there. Uh, it, I think it can or, have... Or an hamper it? Yeah. yeah. It, I would say for every person, what I've noticed, and especially now as I've actually been using more genetics in my day-to-day -day work, I'm starting to see where they don't necessarily, they may not clear even herbs well, let alone drugs well, if there's, or somebody may not have the appropriate opioid receptor or things that, you know, that are really problematic when you're taking certain drugs. So it may not shut down the vagus so much, but it is an interaction that is less than helpful. So let's talk about kind of an, an organic thing happening to a lot of people. Let's get the drug story out of it. You're just overwhelmed with anxiety or overwhelmed with fear. Um, you know, life is feeling like a threat in general. What does that tend to do with the vagus nerve and that delicate communication between all of the organs? Just standard stress, really. Yeah, and you know, it's a really interesting thing because if you think about in the family triangles, we parent the way we wish we were parented, but we parent the way we were actually parented when we're under stress. So if you've ever heard yourself say, my God, I sound just like my mother, or I sound just like my grandmother, or I sound just like my father, or it's that kind of continuum that we've learned this as a pattern. And then that will be the stress pattern, stress pattern which actually sets up a hypnotic sort of trance-like state in the brain. So what then happens is, is that every single time you are in a stressor, whether it be similar or not, the pattern of how we deal with it is, is rooted. There's ruts that get created in the brain. That's absolutely fascinating. And honestly, it's the first time I've heard someone put it that way. Because we like to think of ourselves as what we intend to do, not our default positions, right? <laughs> and yet what you say is very true. Yeah, and actually there is a... a portion in the brain that's starting to be studied much more now called the default mode network. Tell and us it, about it. So it very much is complementary to my theoretic, theoretical understanding of that there really is a, a body-mind nexus of the sort of our spirit consciousness as well as our conscious consciousness. And having to do with this intersection at the hypothalamus and that's the limbic brain. That's where emotions and so many chemical act, so much chemical activity happens. But our default is what we have previously programmed or not programmed and just adopted. So right. the, the program speaks to our ability to say, I have dominion over where I put my mind. I have dominion about where it is that I want to put my attention. It, you know, the interesting part of that is it whether you program it or whether it's default programmed for you, the subconscious will receive it just the same. Exactly. Exactly. And that's our responsibility to be able to look at and change. And I believe that is what ultimately will get us out of suffering. <laughs> Once we can realize that we are really the choosers, we are the ones that have the sovereignty and the domain over where it is that our attention be focused. Okay. Let me go ahead and complicate the story a little bit further before we go into the ways in which we start kind of unwinding um, 
negative patterns in ourselves and, and negative in, ancestral patterns that aren't serving anymore. We don't want to fall into default positions and carry this forward so that our children are exposed to it and then they fall into de default patterns. We want to break that. But th this is, a, to me, a very interesting part and it goes more into the spiritual range. It goes into incarnation. And one of the things that I have understood for quite a number of years is that the that the DNA is extraordinarily important when it comes to choosing an incarnation path. And my understanding of it is that we tend to incarnate back into familiar circumstance, familiar bloodlines, and there's a practical reason for it. If we're working on particular, very specific refinements and lessons and so forth, if this is a gigantic schoolroom on a spiritual level, then we're going to probably put ourselves back into a situation that we can continue to work through. And so that's on a very pragmatic level. But as my understanding uh, is that there are other levels of this of, as well in terms of uh, sheer compatibility between the soul development and the body that it's going to be inhabiting. And so choosing a body that it, it's been imprinted with, the DNA, the bloodline, the ancestral patterns have already been imprinted with, is what we generally tend toward. Even though we can have a breakaway incarnation here and there, generally we can progress our learning by doing it in this way. That's my understanding of it. Do you have any kind of corollary to that in your understanding? Yes, I appreciate what you're saying. And one of the things that I use a lot in my own personal development, as well as with clients, is looking at the North Node in our astrological chart. The North Node is having to do with, like, consider the North Node like you're putting your compass on your own personal North Star. What is the direction in life that is really meant to be lived, your Dharma? The south node is very fascinating, though, because there's gravitational pull there because of the familiar, because of the habits, because of the things that we know so well. So it tends to, because we know it, we tend to go in that direction. And the caution is to not necessarily go in that direction. The, 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 if we could pay attention to these things, I remember reading my own North Node sets of details and just going, oh my God, no wonder. I, it's been such a, I keep taking myself back to what is familiar and it's so painful. And then eventually you realize, wow, I cannot continue to keep going in that direction. So I find that to be, I have found it to be immensely helpful in my own journey, but also with, with clients. So that's one part. No, I think that's absolutely fascinating. Is there another part? Go for it. <laughs> so uh, paying attention to what patterns have and haven't worked. So in what I notice with my family in, in particular is that I, if we become really good observers and good choosers out of the observations, we can sort of toggle up from a higher perspective and be able to look at this. So something that you just brought up about the combination of soul, body, the, the, the combinations of, of what it is that we are in this lifetime, how have we been incar incarnated or reincarnated, is sometimes what I call the high self setup. So um, it, because it's, you know that there's something, uh, at least I believe, that there is some creative entity, some universal creative force that is setting us up if we look at the Vedanta, we look at all these, the, so many different lineages tell us the same thing. We wrote this into being. So if we wrote it into being, then what is it that we're supposed to get out of it? And it takes this combination of blood, tissue, cells, family, all the combinations of things to make it all animate and come alive so that we could actually live it out to our fullest. That makes perfect sense to me. And, and I, as most everything has some kind of rhyme or reason to it, right? Yeah. I think this gives us an orderly way to go about our soul refinements, the process of choosing, as you say, and creating a stepped up version of our understanding, a soul refinement path, 
Um, and it does. It requires all of these things coming together. And my understanding is that when people kind of jump out of this pattern, often what can happen is you'll have someone who would be considered I don't mean politically or socially, but in general, be considered a black sheep in the family, for example. Others don't understand them. They don't feel the same. They don't, they don't do well even with the foods that that family eats. They're, they can often be kind of allergic to everything. And they just don't, this, the entity always feels adrift, like they don't really feel they belong to anything. And they may have made this kind of exciting adventurous uh, experience for themselves to jump into a vehicle of a totally different lineage but my understanding is that oftentimes these people will actually die while they're quite young because they're not going to be able to fulfill what they need to with that much resistance that much difference in their experience interesting um i i have so much to say on this black sheep idea right this I, I find that black sheep, they actually are the change agents. Black sheep, white sheep, they're, they're really, they, they really go together. And um, black sheep, that's a, as a colloquialism, is just meant to say the different one in the herd. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that are not doing herd mentality. And so they're not going to follow in the family footsteps. They are, but there's a lot of pain in that because on this, by the same token, we all have a sense of belonging or a desire for belonging. So when your very family does not accept you or calls you, oh, you're the black sheep of the family, it's hurtful. But if you could embrace, if we all could embrace that idea of the notion of black sheep or rather change agent, as I prefer to call it, is, is, is much more inviting to really be that different person that you're supposed to be. Step in those shoes completely and fulfill the, the differences. Because if we continue on that same continuum, it's just the karmic wheel in that family dynamic playing out again and again and again. And it's oftentimes the so-called black sheep or change agents that are not having the kids. They're choosing not to, to procreate and propagate the same ideas. At least that's what I have found in my own practice. Actually, subconsciously from a DNA level, that would make absolute sense. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, so this is a nice little segue into some of the work you do with healing these transgenerational issues we have. And you, you call it um, uh, Stop the Madness of the Sameness. Now, the black sheep is one of these program disruptors, as you were just talking about. So go ahead and explain to us what that means and how we begin that process. So this very idea of looking at family triangles of we parent the way we wish we were parented, including how we parent ourselves, and we parent the way we were actually parented if we're under stress. So knowing ourselves, I find knowing ourselves is healing myself. So in that process, we can have the awareness of making these clearances because ultimately it becomes our choice. So the transgenerational piece is once you realize that you've been on this sort of same wheel I'm just doing what everybody else is doing and I just need to stop it. I, I need to make a different choice. It really comes to the, from the level of awareness first, I find. And then, then the choice can be made from go, going from there. That piece about how we parent ourselves is so evident in everything we do. How do we treat ourselves in relationships? How do we treat others in relationships? Is it from kindness? Is it from uh, uh, being available to ourselves? Is there self-love? Is there adequate connectivity, vulnerability? All of these things. Learning to trust yourself and the inner child we've talked a little bit about in the past is the inner child, I find, is our first relationship with trust. So that inner child doesn't want to be parented from the outside anymore, but it seeks to have a relationship with us. So in looking at that transgenerational piece where you realize I've just been carrying the torch in the same way, in the same hand, following in the same footsteps, and that awareness helps to make, be able to make that, that distinction. And then the unwinding process, which is a word that I actually use that you just use, which I appreciate because we didn't talk about that, but that's, that's you and I being on the same brainwaves. The, uh, the 
opportunity for unwinding is what I call once we get to an apex of change, we sort of have to get to this like this evolutionary sort of bottom it feels like, or, you know, for addictions and people, it's called rock bottom, right? It's, and there's addictions in every single one of us. So we have to get to that tipping point or that change, that apex of change, that unwinding process brings us to the level of awareness where we get to be that conscious choice maker. That if we choose to come out of that sameness, that that's what will evolutionarily step us up. Whether we've procreated or not, we are changing it for the archetypal scheme for everyone else. So let's say there's um, women have a, a very deep generational wound or, you know, an, ancestral wound of being silenced. And when a woman l- learns to use her power, and is not, it's not necessarily feminism. It's not necessarily anything like that. That's not the, necessarily the point. It doesn't need to be on a platform such as that. But when you truly learn the authenticity of what using your voice is, and you're not trying to flatten anybody, but just be who you are, that is, you are changing that archetypal landscape for anybody else that's having to learn those same lessons. So that's also changing the transgenerational attributes of not keeping things the the way that they were and not living out the same myth. Let's talk about how that changes the rest of the generational pattern. How one person's, we hear this, uh, many times you'll hear it, but it almost becomes a platitude. One person speaks up and it, it essentially and ultimately you reach kind of a hundredth monkey syndrome and it starts infecting the rest of society. But how does it actually work? Oh, you're, for mechanism, I have a belief of how it works is that using Rupert Sheldrake's idea of the morphogenic field, I very much subscribe to that. And I see evidence for it when in healing work. And the thing is, is that when I bring that to a person's awareness about understanding why why is this happening to me why this again why this and it's like well first of all to get it and second of all is to not just leave things the way that at some sort of status quo to actually advance them so that it's easier for the next generation to be able to step on that platform and change it so once again we can look at that that archetypal grid and go, okay, these different set of choices, it's like standing on the shoulders of giants. So that hundredth monkey idea about the, the tipping point of change is because there's been enough people that have come along and made similar choices that actually give us the foundation and courage to be able to make the same steps ourselves. Very good. Very true. And oftentimes we'll even hear about the notion of the nonlinear reality of time, that in doing so it goes back and affects the entities that are our ancestors as well. Do you subscribe to this? And can you talk to us for a moment about it? Oh, thank you so much. The, there is actually a physics experiment called the delayed choice experiment. And it looks at, and many people who are not of quantum mechanics that are just based in in steeped in the regular physics mechanical physics they have a hard time and there's no way to actually explain the delayed choice experiment especially easily right now but essentially what it says is that something that has been done to a particle in the past when it is observed again it 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 changes So Buckminster Fuller also spoke about this. It doesn't matter in what period of time because time is not linear. This is a total human construct that that we have created in order for our, our world to operate in a certain way. And I see evidence in this all the time for non-linearity and healing and non-local and all of these, these kinds of points that are very important for knowing that we can look at a past distant event from something with a whole new set of eyes, from the maturity and resources that we have today 
new updated subconscious mind and conscious mind look at an event from the past and say, I would handle that in this way. There's something that I teach called the review process. And I actually borrowed it from uh, Rudolf Steiner. But actually, I didn't borrow it. It was something that was completely on my own. And then when I found it in Rudolf Steiner's work, it always makes me feel so excited when I find the confirmation in other people's work. And so this Tell was... Tell us about it. So the review process is where you use this idea of nonlinearity. And no matter how distant something is in a memory of the past, if it's still in the back of your, your mind going, getting your attention somewhere, it means there's still something unresolved. And if there's emotion with it, then it really is something that we need to be looking at. So you go and you take a look at that situation and close your eyes and you imagine yourself making that new choice, the hindsight. Hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? So whether it's 10 minutes ago or whether it's 10 years ago, you go and you look at that scene in that situation and you say, with the maturity of resources that I have today, this would be my new choice. And then you imagine a whole new outcome. You imagine it how you, you would have handled yourself. You can't create for another human being. It's not about that. But it's, it is how you handled yourself in that moment. So then you give yourself the ability in the future to have a cellular memory because we will be tested with the same situation in a different scenario with different people. And so then you'll have the, that familiarity within your psyche from which to choose. It's interesting because this, going back to what I was saying earlier about these incarnation patterns, it would also make sense from that point of view. The entities that are going to end up incarnating oftentimes back into the same bloodline will not only be us, but our ancestors, yes. right? Who may show up as either our children or our parents in the future. So if you're putting this into the morphogenetic field, then you have a possibility for everyone to start resonating with that and at that level. But I ask this then, does it have any, is there any need for a buy-in or a choice on the part of the others with this ancestral patterning? Or is it automatic that they'll start resonating with it once you've set this new idea, feeling, understanding into motion? Yes, so I think it's a really important point that you bring up here, Regina, because it still speaks to resonance. And the, the resonance, it, we can't cause resonance in another person, right? But what we can do is offer whatever information may be coming from us energetically, the choice is on the other side. And whether it's ancestral or whoever it is that may have been our child in, from some distant past or our parent or our sibling in some distant past or other lifetime, that as it shows up, it, it has the ability to shift if there's resonance. So I don't think of it necessarily as um, being any sort of karmic weight that we shouldn't be doing because if there's resonance, then it's going to be a match. I, I've seen in my practice where I was working with a, a mother and a son and she couldn't figure out why there was psoriasis all over his body. And he was very young. And um, I think I was working with him when he was about 12. And she was there present in the session. And we processed him. And it turns out she was saving him from a fire in an earlier life. But it was that part of his body which was burned. Yeah. So, and, you know, oh, my God, the emotions, the tears that were coming from both of them. And, you know, then it was able to, and there was a lot more to it. There was a lot more to the dynamic of the family, of the household, of things that were going on for the both of them in that lifetime that needed the resolution. Absolutely. And then it starts showing the effect of it in this lifetime. The body can start relaxing and clearing itself once the understanding is there and the healing's been done. And, you know, I think it's, I think, you know, it's really beautiful because you're talking about being a way shower for your ancestors. You're able to, by accepting and adopting a higher understanding of things, as maybe even the black sheep in the family, it's almost as though you're tossing out an invisible lifesaver for anyone who has drowned in those emotions and dynamics of the past to help draw themselves forward into the new field. Exactly. 
Exactly. <laughs> and, and we can only do it by resonance. Yes. If, if there is a readiness. So we don't have to worry about whether or not we're sort of dipping into somebody else's karma. It's not going to come up unless there is a resonance. Absolutely. Is this a good point where we can get into this down to a mitochondrial level? You talk about something called mitochondrial Eve. Every single, every single atom of our being is programmed from the second we're born. Mm -hmm. and, and right down, certainly functionally, in our bodies to the mitochondria. Let's talk about that and talk about how the changes actually start happening on this physiological, deep, deep physiological primal level. Beautiful. So this idea of mitochondrial Eve actually came from, there was a National Geographic, um, a, it was a, an issue of National Geographic that was talking about when genetics were first being, when the genome was, was mapped out and, and essentially when we look ancestrally, and we don't know how absolutely true any of this is yet, but what I'm finding evidence for is that there, there is a link to our mitochondria coming from our mothers. So generationally, and you get it from both because it's still you're paired from your father's side and your mother's side, and there's a uniqueness in the expression of the genes, right? I mean, just because you have this gene pool doesn't mean two twins have, can have different genetic structures, whether they're identical or, or fraternal. It doesn't, doesn't matter. So the point is, is that this mitochondrial Eve, when we look to the history, she was found to be in Africa. So she is known as being the mother of all humanity. So it was traced to this one particular gene type. So that's where the mitochondrial Eve comes from. And then um, that ancestral river idea that you find as literally a construct, and this is something from Eileen McCusick's work, that where she brings it up as you find it primarily, you find it on both sides, but primarily with a, a very strong emphasis on the left side of the body, about 10 inches off the body. And I've just had some incredible experiences with the ancestral river where accidentally I have found myself in it. It wasn't where I was purposely working, meaning, of course, we were working for healing. But when we got to that part, um, a person that's just laying there still and having no, just laying there peacefully, all of a sudden just like sits up and just starts emoting and crying and is sick to their stomach or, you know, has all these e really emotive responses. They can't keep it in. And all, all I did was move the, the tuning fork or a crystal or whatever it is I might be working with in that, that section of the field. So something happened there and with, without my intention necessarily even. Yes, I find her work interesting. I interviewed her on Gaia a while back. It was within the last year, so it's in the archives there. But um, And also had the experience of having a session from Eileen, one of her tuning sessions, where, as you say, on the left side, which is our kind of our subconscious side that is carrying everything that's been, she just goes back really more or less... Um, for expediency's sake, otherwise, it, I guess you could go back time after time, lifetime, and look at lifetime after lifetime. But we just did a standard session looking at events in this lifetime, and it was very accurate. She used the tuning forks, and you do this as well, and you yes. can see right where an event happened, looking through age, and there will be this boom, almost like a resistance in your field where the tuning fork changes what's coming out of it. It changes the frequencies coming out of it. I found it a really really lovely kind of diagnostic to t tool to see where trauma has hung up in your, your being, in your aura, in your subconscious. Yes. And then, of course, looking at the other side, where it's still stuck and how it's playing itself out today. And everybody's field is different. You know, I had a really weird one in that respect. I had all this trauma, but almost nothing on the right side. It just like, la -di da floating on through life. You know, I don't quite get that one. And everybody's different. She's had other people have very little trauma that they'll find in the left side of the aura. Yet, they have 
all this stuff stacked up in defense of it and in reaction to it in the other side. Maybe just talk about some of your experience in this for just a moment. Yeah, uh, well, these, these big ones are, I appreciate that because everybody's field is very different. And it is the, the beauty of using the fork as well as it's diagnostic and treating at the same time. So it's, it's lovely because you're not just leaving something right. where, where it was. So you're actually changing that discordant energy into being more coherent. So, yeah, I mean, this, this idea that there are these constructs within the field to be able to find the deepest, richest work besides getting shackles off people's ankles and helping them move forward or, you know, figuratively, and sometimes it feels literally, um, that ancestral river piece, I find to be the most profound in freeing a person up. I don't, I can't even explain, but being that the transgenerational piece of healing is so profound, I think, for so many, it's like we are walking around with a whole backpack of stuff on that we have to realize, wait a minute, at some point, this isn't all my work to do. And we have to get clear about this. Is, I'm not supposed to do all of my mom and dad's work. I'm not supposed to do all my grandparents' work. I'm not supposed to do everybody's. So there's got to be some processes that sort of like get me on my own path and help me to step in the 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 shoes that I need to be walking in. And so these, these patterns that you can find around the body where that may be going on and making the choice that, oh yeah, that's part of my history. I just realize that that's part of the story. I don't really need to make that my narrative. And, and there's choice making in that is really what I want to say. Let's, um, we have a few minutes left here. Let's go ahead and talk about what people, we have a lot of really, you know, intelligent and um, highly practiced people that are watching this. We have just the most wonderful audience in the whole world here. And so for people who are already pretty far along on their path, but maybe haven't really jumped on the clearing of the ancestral piece yet, what are some of a few of the things, aside from coming to some of your amazing workshops, I mean, you're very well respected, you do impeccable work. Aside from that, if you're going to kind of, you're a loner and you want to take it on by yourself, what are a few things that we can do on our own to start clearing this? Um, thank you. I, I actually, while I know everybody here is a really advanced, really advanced and advanced thinker, advanced processor, I think working transgenerationally really ideally would be done with another person. Okay. I, uh, it's just my professional opinion. And having seen two people who I respect very, very much going through, and they're very skilled, they went through several meditations that had to do with generational healing. And these are, are meditations that are in people's books, in popular books. And it really caused a kind of uh, psychotic break. Interesting. And it's because they got into something and they didn't know how to get out. Mm -hmm. And that happens. It does happen. Mm -hmm. And to the best of us, it can happen. And so to have somebody to help you, just buddy up. You know, there, there's got to be other people that you work well with being also a professional. But really, to, to buddy up because there's going to be things that, that they may see words used, patterns seen, all these kinds of things that could be threads. And somebody from the outside looking in is going to be much more objective than, and be able to see them more thoroughly to be able to truly step out of it. So my advice would be don't necessarily take it on alone. Um, I'm, I'm all for doing as much work on your own as possible, of course. But this one, I've just, I've seen you know yeah from it I hear you I mean it's like somebody doing their own regression work you, you can't do that right off I mean you can do it over a period of time if you've done a lot of it with another person but it's not something that I would necessarily recommend having a background in 
in that, um, yes. doing it by yourself initially. So mm -hmm. Tiffany, um, some final thoughts on this, the need to heal this and the beginning point of healing it besides making that choice that you don't, you don't choose to carry this forward anymore. Any final thoughts on that? Um, let's see. In not choosing to, first of all, is making the decision that you don't want to carry it on anymore. Mm -hmm. and once we come to that awareness and we've done a, a good amount of digging and looking at the shadow aspects and looking at how it's served in our life, then it's that apex of change. We come to that ability to be able to see, okay, I'm the one standing here. I'm the one that can choose the emotion. You know, what's interesting about this, if, if um, you've ever looked into Lisa Feldman's work, she um, has a book called How Emotions Are Made. And, and she's actually taking on uh, quite a, the, the whole industry about facial recognition and emotions and um, saying that that's not the way to necessarily read somebody's emotions. And it's very dangerous that we're actually going in that direction societally and governmentally and policy wise, etc. Um, so how our emotions are made are by the patterns of who we are. So the the learned habits, all of those things, I really go back to knowing thyself is healing thyself. It's it's really this was not an accident that the temp, the oracle at the Temple of Delphi said, know thyself. Right. And, and then the other adage was everything in moderation or nothing in excess, however you translate it. So the, the couple of pearls I would say were, are be willing to go to those depths to get to that apex of change. Because when we do that, we are changing the external landscape for others to be able to take that same journey. And sometimes it can feel so lonely in that we are really doing all of the shadow work in this sort of vacuum and what's it all for and why, et cetera. And there's a bigger reason why. So, and we're all in it together. We need to help each other out. <laughs> we do need to help each other out. And praise be the black sheep of the world, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. So, Tiffany, um, I know you have uh, workshops that you have regularly, and you also work individually with people. Is the best way to reach you at healandthrive.com, or is there some other way that's better? Yeah, that is the best way. Through so right. people can go there, they can write to you directly if they, they want to engage with you, right? Yes, they can. I, I'm, I'm sometimes slow because I am a little overwhelmed right now, but yes, I will get back. Yeah, I just, I love sitting with you at Gaia. I love the fact that we can have this conversation today and we will come back because um, you're capable of talking about quite a few different subjects and I find all of them fascinating. So we just kind of took a sliver today. So until next time, thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Regina. Same to you. Again, Tiffany Barsati, and you can go to healandthrive.com to either get in touch with her directly or attend one of her workshops. Until next time, thank you for joining us here on reginameredith.com. Thank you for watching this video. You can find many more like it free of charge by going to reginameredith.com. And if you're finding that this kind of content is adding value to your life, you might want to support my work by clicking on the Patreon button on the website, reginameredith.com. As a patron, you have special videos, insider commentary, and much more. Check it out.